Hello, everybody. My name is Aaron Canole, and welcome back once again to another edition of the Movie Battleground. And this is the first match of two in our fifth Battleground Blitz event. If this happens to be your first time watching, uh, as always, welcome for joining us in a 79th, I believe, episode of a show. Welcome. Uh, but what is a Battleground Blitz? This means that we are going to have two matches back-to-back -back in quick succession. Uh, the next match coming up after this is a very, very big one, uh, but we'll discuss that just a little bit later. Obviously, if you have follows on the Facebook page, you already know what it is. But this one right here, we decided if the next match is going to be kind of a culmination of OGs of the league, what a better way to set it up then bring in some rookies because we have two competitors who have, well, never competed isn't a hundred percent correct. One of them has played an exhibition match, but they have never competed in an official battleground match. They are here. That is Alejandro Hernandez who previously appeared for us in the uh, 420 exhibition match. And I mean, I don't, I can't speak for him, but it looked like he was having a hell of a time. I assume he's a little more sober this time around and he is going up against Zach Shelton, who is here to make his debut. Zach getting into the league because somebody dropped out and we had a slot open up and he had wanted to play. So he gets to take advantage of that and come in. And I will go ahead and speak to him first because making his debut in the movie Battleground, he is Zachary Shelton. Zach, welcome, sir. How are you doing today? Good. I'm just ready to compete. Absolutely, man. So yeah, as I said, originally, uh, this, you know, you had reached out to me a little while ago, and, and I had told you that it would be a little while before we could start new people in because we already had a wave of new people. Uh, and obviously, we had all the old people still playing. It's a pretty big roster, and you can't let it get too big. Otherwise, it just becomes impossible to manage. Uh, but you know, things happen, unfortunately, behind the scenes, we had somebody who made a decision to step away before getting to make their debut. And I was able to turn that slot around to you so that Alejandro could get himself a rookie competitor. So now that you're here, you've had that opportunity. Uh, just kind of what are your general thoughts coming into this debut? Uh, like I said, I'm excited to finally compete. Uh, I'm excited to face Alejandro. I think the questions for the match are going to be kind of interesting. So let's go. Absolutely, man. Straight to the point. Well, I will sit you in the back for just a moment while I introduce your opponent. Also coming in for his official debut, although he did previously appear in our excellent and weird as hell 420 match. He is Alejandro Hernandez. Alejandro, welcome back, sir. Uh, I do have to officially confirm, not that I care all that much, but I assume you are more sober this time than you were then. Just a little bit. It's it's strictly post-show fans, obviously. Obviously, obviously, obviously. I'm a professional. Uh, but yeah, man, welcome back. So before that match was supposed to happen, as we kind of briefly discussed, you were set up for a match. Unfortunately, that quite didn't work out the way that we wanted it to. And then we were able, once that 420 match happened, we were able to turn you around and put you into this one. So how are you feeling now? You know, you're not going up against a gangbang of competitors. It's one other competitor who is of a closer, similar skill to you in terms of experience. So how are you feeling going into that in terms of confidence level? I feel like one on one is going to be obviously way easier. Uh, it's going to be way less for the judges to have to consider when making decisions. Not that I have any ill feelings about that. Like you were saying, I had a blast. Excellent and weird as hell is kind of my bag. So uh, I, I'm super excited to get into the point of these. I think these questions are great, particularly. And uh, I, I may have jumped the gun a little bit on my answers, but uh, I'm stuck with them now. So we'll see how hard I can sell them. <laughs> that, that is the way to look at it, because that's kind of what it is. You picked what you picked, and now it's come time to see how it works out for you, man. So I'm going to go ahead and bring Zach back in and let's go ahead and get into this. Movie Battleground is a game that is a best of five rounds. It is a first to three points wins. Each round of debate is worth one point. If one of our competitors tonight does happen to earn the first three points in a row, that is going to be a victory by way of knockout. However, we'll deal with that when we get there. And vice versa, if it is a 2-2 tie after four rounds, we do have a blind round question. I would hate to subject that to you guys on your very first match, but if we have to, we will. Uh, we shall 
see uh, in terms of the actual main rounds. These guys have given the questions ahead of time. They've had their chance to prep as much as they can. The way the match goes is there will be a 60-second opening argument followed by a two-minute solo pitch slash expansion to just kind of discuss their points a bit more. There will be a four-minute open discussion where they'll go back and forth respectfully while also getting in punches and picking up points as much as possible, followed by a 60-second chance to close out and finalize the argument. Once all that is said and done, I do have two great judges backstage in the form of Chris Diaz and Austin Howell. They will come on screen and based off of what was said we'll make a deliberation on who wins in the event that they are split i will also be taking notes and will then serve as a third tiebreaker judge should we need to uh but with all that out of the way guys are we ready to go i'm ready let's kick it up all right so we're gonna go ahead and jump into it and the first question uh of the match uh in celebration of uh well there's no movie coming out not that there was ever supposed to be a movie coming out but i feel like every time i've tried to time a question from this franchise to a movie coming out they just shift the release date because that's kind of what they're known for at this point i mean earlier this year they released a promo celebrating all of their films coming out in 2022 and then proceeded to move half of them out of the year of 2022 about three weeks later which really just shows where we're at with d C. And while I would argue that some of their films recently have been in the higher echelon of their quality over the last couple of years, uh, we're going to talk about some shit films, specifically in the shit decade for them that was the 2000s, in which we had what Christopher Nolan made and everything else. The question is, what is the worst DC film released in the 2000s? So prior in the setup to the match, Alejandro, because you do at least have that exhibitions match worth of experience, you were deemed the favorite tonight. So you had the choice of which questions to go first on. You chose to go first on questions one and three. Zach, you will get to go first on two and four. And guys, as I bring in your timer, uh, because it is your first time here, I do want to give you an official best of luck. I wish you both well in the debates. I will disappear. And Alejandro, when you begin speaking, your minute will start. Aaron, you are 100% correct. There are a ton of DC films that are just garbage from the 2000s to pick from. For me, one of them stands out above the rest, Catwoman. My goodness, this movie had, I, I don't want to say it had a lot of potential, but it did have the opportunity to set up Catwoman as a legitimate superheroine and maybe take off in that direction. I, I, I think it's one of the most... I think it commits the biggest sin that a movie can commit in that it's just boring. It's uninteresting, and everything they try to do with it just falls flat. I can't imagine ever like trying to kick off a franchise from something like that. Uh, not that franchises were a big thing back in 2004, but we had superhero sequels that were starting to take off. Both Spider-Man movies had already come out. We're just on the foot of getting the Christopher Nolan Batman movies, but... Catwoman is a waste of time, and it's a terrible film, and I think it's the worst of the DC films from the 2000s. All right, and that is Alejandro's first minute. Zach, we jump over to you for your first minute on the battleground. It starts when you begin speaking. Now, uh, Catwoman might be a bad movie, but I think there's an even worse movie, and to me, that movie is Watchmen from 2009. I like in terms of if you're talking about boring, at least with Catwoman, you had a shorter runtime. This one just seemed to drag on forever. And I'll get more into it with my two minutes. So I see the rest of my time. Okay. All right. Choosing to go for a first 30 seconds rather than a first minute, but it is a tactic that has worked for people before. Alejandro, when the clock hits zero, you can begin speaking. If you need me to pause it, let me know. I can keep going. I think uh, that this movie had absolutely nothing going for it. It had a great cast. I'll, I'll give it that. Uh, Sharon Stone, Halle Berry, Benjamin Bratt, Alex Borstein. I don't think any of these people are bad in, in entertainment at all. But I think given them uh, a visual effects director who hadn't directed a movie previously was uh, a terrible idea. There's a there's a lot of wasted time in the movie. It, it's it's incoherent. It, <laughs> the plot centers around makeup like the, that's the big villain of the or that's the big bad plan for the movie is it, it centers around makeup that makes women ugly or something because vaginas and we can't tell a story like that for for some reason like 
this movie's insulting in that way, uh, and not only in that regard, but also as a, a Batman uh, franchise movie, because Selena Kyle's not in the movie. We don't get any of that uh, for this movie. Not again, franchises aside. And I will actually agree with you, Zach. Watchmen is a bad movie, <laughs> uh, but I I know a lot of people who would die on the hill that that movie is uh, one of the better superhero films. Uh, I don't know anybody who would say Catwoman is a good movie, let alone one of the better DC movies of all time. Uh, Watchmen, for me, was like, I was in awe when I saw it in the movie theater. Like, everybody around me was like, whoa, that was so awesome. And I'm like, did we watch the same movie? I really don't understand. <laughs> but, I mean, eh, popular demand, I think Everybody else would disagree with you. I think Catwoman is probably going to get number one on that shit list. And just because it always comes up, it did get a 9% on Rotten Tomatoes and 18% uh, on the audience score. I don't particularly care about that, but for some reason it constantly comes up in the matches, so I'm going to throw that out there. And uh, I'll give you that last five. All right. Zach, when you begin speaking, two minutes on the clock. So you mentioned the casting for Catwoman, and I think that's actually kind of an issue with Watchmen in a way, because at least with Catwoman, you get Halle Berry that people know of, and at least you know of the, uh, at least you know of Catwoman. With Watchmen, it's like, it, these are people that were, were able to find success like later on after this, but none of them are like household names. And to me, it's just like this movie has so many boring and kind of not interesting characters. It's more of like if you're not familiar with the comic book series of Watchmen, then it has a harder time like appealing to you. And it seems like it has to work harder compared to someone like Catwoman. And the other thing is, like, it seems like it tries to be serious, and it doesn't really work on that. It takes itself too seriously, and it just fails on that. Zack Snyder, yes, he's had some successes, but this movie had a lot of potential, and it just it didn't work. As compared to Catwoman, now, the one thing I will say about Catwoman is, like, it's cheesy, but I think that's the point. It tries to be cheesy, and that's maybe what appealed to me more. It doesn't work at all times, but at least it has that factor to it. And I see the rest of my time. All right. That was, clock. That was damn near perfect. Okay, we're going to go ahead and go into the four-minute open discussion. Since it is your guys' first time, I always like to give the reminder that while there is no official rule as to when to stop speaking, when to speak, uh, always be respectful, make your point, and allow the person to rebut. Don't eat up the time because I will call you on it if you do. But with that said, four minutes is on the clock. It starts when the first competitor speaks. I'd like to counter that Catwoman uh, tries to be cheesy, but fails super hard at it. There's so many cat puns in the movie. It's, it's like watching the spirit. It's just painful to get through um I, I, is it is it worse to be try try to be serious and fail at it or try to be funny and fail at it because if they're trying to be funny they are falling flat <laughs> yeah but again like sometimes again maybe too many cat puns is a bad thing but it it still it, it's bring something different to it the other, the other thing I'm not a fan of with at least Watchmen is it just seems like it just throws things in there just to throw them in. Like that random sex scene in the ship, just it seems like, okay, that was That happened. There. For sure. Absolutely. But, and again, with Catwoman, it's like, like, like you have Halle Berry, who has had success, but you also go into it and you get to see her kicking some ass. It's just like, that that does work for the movie. Like, who would not want to see that in the movie? In the movie, for sure. It work in the work. It works in the trailer. <laughs> it doesn't quite work in the movie because I don't care. Like, it's so boring and so dull. Like, 
how do you have Halle Berry in a skin tight leather outfit and me not care? I don't understand that. Uh, Oh, I would also like to counter really quickly uh, your argument that Watchmen isn't a name. There are a lot of movies that are comic book movies that didn't have a name that are super popular, like The Mask. Uh, that's one of my favorites. That's a comic book movie that took off, like took the world by storm. I don't think you necessarily need to be a name. I do think it helps, but uh, Watchmen, just because it's not a name, doesn't mean it's going to fail. No, and I and I I understand that. It just it seems like it seems like you have to work extra hard for that name, but it doesn't really work. And going back to the boring thing, it's just like your movie is like an hour and a half. So that's at least manageable. Mine is almost three hours long. And if you are bored in a movie that just, it, it seems like it doesn't work yeah. for that amount of time. It definitely does not see the Batman, but, um, I would argue that all, your cast was also pretty star-studded uh, with Patrick Wilson, Malin Ackerman, and Jackie Earl Haley, who, yeah, Jackie Earl Haley, he had to wait until Watchmen to actually get a name for himself and really couldn't pick up the ball with it. I think he was going to make a great Freddy Krueger, personally. That's just me. But well, well, and before that, was Patrick Wilson big in anything else before Watchmen? Because it's just like... Watchmen, the, way with Pat, yeah. the only thing I know of Patrick Wilson... From is like the conjuring and that was i feel like that was part of his big break along with him, but like it's not right. his household of a name he's not a household name i would i would definitely agree with you but he did he did the phantom of the opera he played raul which is a crazy difficult part <laughs> uh it, any part in that show would be crazy difficult but raul particularly that do, that's a high tenor part and i as a musician i appreciate that and you, so again, so and that's another thing. Like if you know that, then you'll understand that character. But again, it's just like the characters to me were just they tried too hard and they were they just didn't bring enough pizzazz that you wanted. And it's like it's set in the eighties with the Cold War, and I feel like we get a lot of those types of movies. At least with this, I know it's a makeup thing, but at least it was it veered into something different. I mean, it tried something different <laughs> and failed miserably. My God, it failed miserably. Uh, also, uh, for that random sex scene, I'm pretty sure it's in Malin Ackerman's contract that she has to get nude in every movie that she's in. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Everything I've seen her do, I've had to see her tits. It's happened every time. And time. I'm just going to get ahead of it and say I don't think there's any way it could legally fact check that one. Uh, but with that said, we're gonna go on to the. No, you're good. We're gonna go on to the closings. Uh, Alejandro, you, you didn't say anything bad. I was just making a joke. Uh, we're, we're gonna, Alejandro, you are up first, sir. You have one minute left on the clock for the round. Time starts when you begin speaking. I forgot this was a family show. My bad. Um, no, no, no. It's not a family think, show at all. Joke. It was. <laughs> I think Catwoman is uh, just the worst kind of movie it, it wastes your time it gives you nothing in return and it, it it it's gone in a flash you remember absolutely nothing about it would anybody have actually remembered that the plot was about makeup had i not said something but watchmen i think stylistically Zack snyder has a way with working the camera that appeals to people i think uh everybody on screen is at least excited to be doing a superhero movie, especially Jack Earl Haley. That dude stepped out into the spotlight super hard. Nobody benefited from Catwoman. Nobody walked away from Catwoman a better actor. I'm pretty sure that's when uh, Halle Berry started doing like Gothica. But I digress. I, I think that Catwoman was... Uh, I wanted it to be good. I really did. I wanted that movie to succeed, but I couldn't justify liking it at all. Like, I like Ang Lee's Hulk for various reasons. Not a great movie, but I can justify it. Not with Catwoman. And time. Okay, Zach, back over to you, sir. You have one minute left on the clock. So, again, like I said with my movie, it's too long with a, a boring kind of story and characters with just random things thrown in i will say this if there were two teams i would rather watch than the watchmen they're the mystery men and they're the league of extraordinary gentlemen 
those two those two groups at least had some chemistry and at least you were willing to see them unlike the watchmen where it just to me it tried too hard and maybe catwoman didn't work on the cheesy but at least it was trying to be cheesy and not take itself too seriously and i see the rest of my time okay all right guys a very solid first round officially welcome to the battleground i'm gonna go ahead and sit you both in the back as i bring forth our judges uh if diaz is there if his camera froze again i know he can definitely hear us through most of it but anyways we'll go ahead and get into it uh just a couple of fact checks to pull up so when it was brought up uh that when catwoman was coming out uh, this was at the kind of pinnacle rise of franchises and superhero book movies and that is absolutely true when you look at the marvel side of things uh obviously months differentiate but if we simply look at the year in general in 2004 when catwoman was released uh, by that point the entire blade trinity had been or blade trilogy had been completed as blade trinity also came out in 2004 we had already seen two spider-man movies we also saw the first two x-men movies and we do also know that marvel attempted to launch a third franchise with hulk obviously that would later be rebooted but into the mcu so it didn't quite work uh daredevil also came out which technically did have a sequel in electra if you want to count that not that that's good but it did happen uh when we look at dc catwoman was actually the first after a number of years break for dc uh, in 1997 they had a legendary year when they released batman and robin and steel into theaters within 12 months good going guys uh, they decided to stop making movies for a number of years. They came back. They had a number of films in development. Superman was getting a reboot. Batman was getting a reboot. They were doing Constantine to have something different. And Catwoman got made. That was the first of these films to go to theater. And thank God they didn't cancel anything else that came out after it. Uh, with that said, Rotten Tomatoes was brought up. So I did the quick fact check on it. Catwoman does have a 9% critic-like rating on Rotten Tomatoes. It has an 18% audience-like rating. While Watchmen isn't exactly the most positive, it is more positive than that at 65% for critics and 71% for audiences. Uh, what was the next thing? Uh, when we look at runtime for the film, uh, they were both mostly accurate when it comes to runtime uh catwoman comes in at 104 minutes uh as a runtime watchman is 163 minutes so one is certainly far longer than the other uh in terms of patrick wilson's success since that was questioned uh prior to watchman he was actually most known as a uh, stage actor he has he is a, a two-time tony award nominee for the full monty and oklahoma he had also won or been nominated for a Golden Globe and Primetime Emmy for work on HBO uh, with his first big film and only real big film prior to Watchmen being Phantom of the Opera. Aside from that, he was one of the stars of the uh, film Little, uh, Little Children, which also saw Jackie Earl Haley get his Academy Award nomination. So they had actually worked together prior to Watchmen and Jackie Earl Haley was nominated. And the final fact check is Gothica, which is a movie I'd never heard of before now, came out the year before Catwoman in 2003. Uh, but with that said, Chris, does appear to be back with us so i will try and bring him in i do not know what is happening uh with him but we'll see what happens there austin i will go to you first sir uh, who gets your vote and what was the main selling yeah again another pleasant back and forth that i'm not used to from my own matches uh so i get uh weird no, you make this home miserable. <laughs> yeah uh so uh uh you know kind of vague on both parts i i i was kind of waiting for the claws to come out not to, to make a cat pun but uh on either side uh but i i felt like uh uh zach countered a little more and and, and hit a little harder on on catwoman and uh, alejandra for the most part just kind of agreed with him so for that's that point i'll just give it to zach Okay, so the first vote does go to Zach. Chris, I go over to you, sir. Who gets your vote and what sold you? Hello. I cannot hear a thing that you are saying, Chris. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys. Yeah, sorry. We were having a little bit of internet issue there on Chris's end, but he was able to turn his whiteboard around. So Zach is going to get the first point here. Uh from the judges. Guys, thank you so much. I'll go ahead and set you in the back. Chris can still hear us 100%. We were able to test that. Uh, so while we get the camera side of things figured out, I will give him some time there and we'll go ahead and bring the competitors back in and move on to question number two. And uh, for question number two, 
we are going into the realm of Middle Earth, another very, very geeky thing, uh, going from DC Comics to Middle Earth. Uh, and the question here is, we were, we were just talking about, in that round, kind of perfectly, you guys were talking about the different types of characters that were in those films. So let's talk some more about some characters. I can already see Austin smiling behind the scenes because I'm sure he loves Middle Earth. I actually don't know, but I know it's... I, yeah, no, there it is. There's the smile. All right, guys, the question is, who is the best character in a Middle Earth film? We are not arguing performance. We are not arguing the movies. We are arguing the characters. Uh, I mean, I guess performance is a part of that, but it's not the whole thing. It's kind of everything together. Uh, but with that said, I'll go ahead and bring it up. Uh, Zach, you were up first on this one, so I will go ahead and bring the timer in, and you can begin speaking when ready, sir. So when I thought of the best character in a Middle Earth film, the first name that came to mind was Bilbo Baggins. And for the main reason of that, he's kind of embodying what we would be if we were in his situation. And for that, I feel like he is the best character in a Middle Earth fi uh, film. And... I'll explain more in my two minutes. Uh, for that, I just see the rest of my time. Oh, okay. All right. We'll go ahead and jump it forward there for Alejandro. You have one minute on the clock when you begin speaking. There are very few characters in Middle Earth that are infallible. Uh, every character has their flaws and weaknesses and so forth, except for two, uh, at least in my estimation, the one I went with was Samwise Gamgee. Like, I think, uh, hands down, anybody would think Sam is the best character in the Middle Earth franchise. He's regarded as the hero of the story, kind of behind the scenes. He's like, uh, uh, what's his name, Pancho, uh, for Don Quixote. You know, he just follows him around but and, and just kind of keeps him out of trouble. That's his role. He's like the guardian for Frodo. And he takes that role very seriously. But Samwise Gamgee, and I'll go ahead and get this out of the way. Sean Astin's performance is great. Like he owns the character. I can't imagine anybody playing him but Sean Astin. So uh, that's that's all I'm gonna say about that. Cause I actually did read the book. So I'm ready to get into that two minutes. I'll go ahead and give that 10. All right, so we'll go ahead and count it down here. Zach, when it gets over to you, uh, if you need me to pause it for a moment, I can. But once the clock turns, you can go ahead and start speaking. So, like I said, that Bilbo is kind of us. You get to experience his ups and downs and all that he gets to experience. And one other thing is that he is able to show a lot of courage and bravery again, like us, if we were in that situation, like he is very small, but uh, when Thorin is almost like encountered by Azog, the defiler, like he is ready to jump right in front of him and, and defend Thorin. He's also been able to uh, match wits with Gollum and with, trolls like he's able to evade them he has experiences with smaug so it's just like he's put in all of these perilous situations and the character is just so well thought out and well done that you are able to display courage and bravery in the main character which is your focal point for the Hobbit movies. And I will say I did enjoy re-watching these for this question. And um, I just feel like with Sam, and we'll get more into it, I feel like it's more loyalty over courage and bravery. And I'll, that's all I'll say, and I'll, I will cede my time. All right, apologies there for the slight delay on that. We'll go ahead and bounce the clock forward. Oh, that's a little too far, but you'll get those seconds back, sir. Time starts when you begin speaking. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Bilbo being us is kind of uh, 
or I should say, being in a perilous situation is kind of the deal with Middle Earth. So you kind of have to uh, show that courage and bravery in order to survive. Uh, Bilbo, I think, yeah, he's written as uh, someone who we would be like. Sam is more like who we would want to be. We want to be that friend that you call, you know, in the middle of the night when you're having problems. We want to be that guy that you come to, uh, that you trust, that you know will trusts you and will never let you down. Uh, I think Sam's got loyalty, sure, but he's also determined. Like, he he gets his task and he does not deviate from it. He, he just carries it out. Don't, don't you lose him. And he takes that very seriously. Uh, sure, Bilbo faced off against Azog. Sam faced off against a, sp a giant spider. <laughs> Shelob could have easily killed him, uh, but his relentless dedication to Frodo kept him alive, and it, it does that. Bilbo, sure, he matched wit wits with Gollum. Sam did not put up with any of that nonsense. He didn't take the time to give him the time of day. He told him to get lost, and that would have been the end of it had it not been for Frodo. Um, like I said, I think everybody has their strengths and weaknesses. I'm not dogging on the Bagginses at all, but they are flawed characters um, in comparison to Sam. And the other option I was going to go with was Aragorn, but he's he's supposed to be the king. He's written like that. So th that's why he gets a pass. And Sam is hands down the best character from Middle Earth. He, he He's kingly. He He's the quintessential hobbit. All he cares about is gardening, uh, eating, and smoking weed. But that's that all takes a back seat when his friends are in trouble. I think that's something that you would uh, aspire to be and not necessarily something that you are, uh, which is why I think Sam is a great character and deserves to be the best character in Middle Earth. Is he uh, the actual hero of the story? That's up for interpretation. That's how text works. And I'll go ahead and give you that eight. All right. So we are going to go ahead and move on to the open discussion round, the timer will start when the first competitor speaks. I just feel like with Sam, it's like you get to see all the great qualities about him, but that's because it, since he's like the secondary character to Frodo, it's like it, the movie only shows you what they want you to see. So I just feel like that kind of undermines him a little bit. And yes, uh, Sam did fight off against a giant spider, but like I said, Bilbo has faced off against uh, way more, and it just like it shows. Also, it just shows with like the trolls and with Gollum that he doesn't need to use like um, any weapons except for his mind to overcome them. I don't know what you're talking about, man. He he has sting with him. All the time. <laughs> Even when he's playing the riddle game with Gollum, he's got him at point with it. That match wits, I suppose. I would call it blind luck. <laughs> yeah. And again, Sam had the had the dagger with uh, the spider. So Yeah, again, he, he the other thing thing with, as well. The other thing with Bilbo is that you get to see his mind work in a different way in terms of like coming up with plans and like rescuing in terms of like the barrel scene, that was all his thought. So it's like you get like the ups and downs, like I said, but you also get to see all the different, like uh, the way his mind works in various situations. I would say that Bilbo, uh, I have to go back to what you said about Bilbo facing a, a lot of perils. Because, yeah, he sure did, but Sam faced the ultimate peril. He had to fight his best friend in order to save the world. Like, it doesn't get harder than that. <laughs> well, and again, I maybe this character is not Bilbo's friend, but he also had to face the uh, lust of light, or not lust, but like the, I guess the bloodlust of Thorin and how that changed Thorin in a way. And so he had to go up against that in the movies uh i think they were regarded as friends at that point um perhaps not fully but uh, again uh, text is up for interpretation but he yeah he he does put up with a lot of stuff but so does sam man like he has to give away his pony to be so they can go into the mines 
Like, that's just me. He he didn't fight off any of the orcs except with a fi- frying pan in that one. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, like you want to talk about again, I, again I, so both do do show courage and bravery. I it just, and loyalty is also big in both characters. So uh, I just feel like the courage is shown more with Bilbo, and I just feel like that's what makes him maybe a little bit better character. I suppose I, my thing is that Bilbo complains a lot, and he wants to go home the whole time. Sam wants to go home too, but he's not about to tell anybody that. <laughs> he's he's ready to see this through. But you also get to see kind of like Sam like has the same demeanor throughout. It seems like you do see a change though in Bilbo. You get to see like the strength building up and all of that, and the uh, sa- saving of his friends and the courageousness. So I just. So at least with that, like I said, the ups and downs, it's like you at least get to see the change with Bilbo. I, I think it's less about what Bilbo does and more about how people see him. At least that's the way it's described in the book. Like Gandalf, Elrond, Aragorn, like they all have a high respect for Bilbo or not Aragorn. He's not until later on, but that's besides the point. And they all build him up to have this confidence, to have this air about him. And they teach him how to speak Elvish and they indoctrinate him into the com- uh the fellowship in it, or sorry, the conference. I, I forgot the word. Can't pull it. All good. All good. We're going to go to the one minute closings. Uh, Zach, you are up first for that time starts when you begin speaking. So I just want to say, I do think Sam is a good character in the series as well. I think both are good to me. The biggest thing, like I mentioned at the beginning is I just feel like if we were in the same situations of, having not wanting to leave our comfort zone and having to go on this great adventure. I feel like it is more personified in Bilbo than it is Samwise. And again, you get to see more of the ups and downs and all the things that Bilbo has to face with both himself and just the perils that he has to deal with. And that is why I think he is the greatest character in middle earth. And I see it the rest of my time. All right. Alejandro, when the clock turns to zero, you can go ahead and start speaking. I can pause it if you need. Yes, sir. Um, Samwise has a lot of qualities that I think uh, people want in their own lives. Bilbo, we have a lot of information about him, so he has to have flaws. He's the main focus of The Hobbit. And I do agree with you. Those movies get better, especially every time a Star Wars movie comes out. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, Bilbo, or I should say Sam, because he's not the focus, he does get bigger moments. He Everything he does builds him up to be that that uh, reliable friend that you really need. Crest of reliability for all my Digimon fans out there. Um, I think that Bilbo could uh, be construed, or I should say interpreted, as a, uh, as a good person. Uh, again, I think it's more the way the characters around him build him up, but and that's just the look of the draw thing, but Sam would automatically be like, oh, he's the good guy, obviously. Like, that's that's not up for interpretation. That's how he's written. That's the way that guy operates, and that's why when I'm in trouble, I want Samwise Gamgee in my corner. All right, that is time. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and put you in the back. Another good debate there. I'm going to go ahead and bring the competitors on screen. Uh, there's nothing really to fact check uh because it was mostly opinion i probably could have deep dived a middle earth wiki somewhere but (laughs) i'm not that kind of time so chris i'm gonna go to you first (laughs) who gets your vote and what was the main selling point there's a little confusing around i don't know about first things that pulled out in the end that needs more now but go go and just think that alejandro does focus on what me but he gives enough to understand what made him a good character just heard like different application maybe Okay, so the first vote does go to Zach. Austin, I go down to you. Who gets your vote, and what was the main selling point? Uh, this one, um, yeah, w- was was a good uh, back and forth. Uh, I, I thought Alejandro, for me, uh, actually brought it in a lot of the counters in the in the middle round uh, and really dove into the interpretations of the character, uh, the deep dives, the motivations, um, and just gave me more kind of uh, pros for his character. So I went uh, Alejandro on this one. 
Yeah, absolutely. Which means it'll uh, turn over to me. And uh, yeah, I, I think this was a, a very excellent round. I think you guys went very back and forth. I think you guys had a lot of great points and I think you guys had a lot of great counterpoints. And the thing is at the end of the day, you guys kind of settled on these characters are kind of both shades of the same ideals and that's kind of why they stand out and it comes down to the little specifics so it, it's a very thin technicality to give a point on but i think it was so close that it is the thing that breaks it um i'm going to give the point to alejandro because earlier on in the debate the approach that zach took was he basically sold that uh sam was loyalty and bilbo was more bravery and uh, confidence and things like that. And then he kind of sort of backtracked on that and sort of tried to work in the loyalty more into it. Whereas I, I think that kind of downplayed his argument a little bit because Alejandro approached it from a much more well-rounded perspective from the jump that I think he was able to sell through. Uh, and again, it's, it's a nitpick technicality, but when you guys debated it as well as you guys did, that's what it comes down to. Uh, so that is going to be the point there. Judges, thank you guys so much. I'll go ahead and sit you both in the back. Uh, and bring the competitors back in to move on to question number three. It was a good, uh, it was a good round. Good round. Good rounds, right? <laughs> it was it was a good round. And now we are going to move on to something that is uh, not uh, <laughs> Middle Earth. We're going on to a gentleman by the name of Tom Hanks. And Tom Hanks uh, has a movie coming up, if my release dates are correct. Uh, he is in a movie called Elvis. He's playing old Tom Parker. I believe that's the guy's name. Uh, don't hate him for his accent. I know it sounds weird, but seriously, go look up a clip of that guy talking. Tom Hanks has pretty much nailed whatever weird European Southern accent mix that guy had. Uh, but the question is, because I clicked on it way ahead of time, what is the best Tom Hanks movie released in the 2000s? Uh, the 90s is the decade that I think most people think of of when they think Hanks. Uh, but the 2000s had a lot of good options as well. We got two from the competitors here today, and I'm going to go ahead and get into it. Uh, and Alejandro, I will bring the timer up for you uh, to go first on, uh, and the timer will start when you begin speaking. I would agree and disagree that Tom Hanks uh, is associated with the 90s only because there was a, a foldover from the early 2000s that I think a lot of the older folks wouldn't associate with the early 2000s. No, that was still the 90s. But I think the best one out of all of them from the 2000s was The Terminal. Man, I love that movie. It's such a great film. Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks once again coming out. And uh, I'm not sure why, but this movie has a lot of hate. <laughs> uh, I'd like to throw that out there first. I, I don't I don't get it personally. It's kind of like back to the Watchmen thing. I don't get why you like it. I don't get why people hate it. Uh, the Terminal is one of those movies that it gives you everything you could possibly want. It gives you a love story. It gives you comedy. It gives you a little bit of action, uh, just a little bit. And it gives you a character that you can comfortably hate, which I think is super important. It's something that we lose in films nowadays. We always have to have a sentimental villain. Uh, Stanley Tucci as the villain, does, uh, he's got motivations that seem pure on his side, but in practice, you actually hate him. So uh, for that reason and a multitude of others I'll get into, I like the terminal quite a bit. All right, and that is time. All right, guys. I'm so uh, I really enjoy this question because Tom Hanks is actually my favorite actor, so he kind of can't do much wrong, if if any. But the movie I picked definitely was able to show like his range of emotions, and you really got to see all that he was able to put into the role. And for that, my choice is Castaway. And I will see the rest of my time for uh, thoughts with my two minutes. All right. Uh, since we have a little bit of time here, I I'm just going to go ahead and say I agree with you, man. Tom Hanks is an absolutely excellent actor. And I could, I did think he could do no wrong. Uh, then I saw The Circle in theaters a few years ago, and that changed my perspective on things because, oh, boy, that movie sucks. Uh, but uh, with that yes, thing, I, go ahead I agree, and... yes. <laughs> that movie's crap. Uh, all right, Alejandro, you'll get those seconds back, but you have your two minutes sir, when you begin speaking for the terminal. I think Castaway is a great movie, first of all. But again, there's just so many to pick. You you can't settle on just 
a Tom Hanks film, or I should say, you throw a rock at a Tom Hanks film from the 2000s, and you're going to hit something good. Uh, for this one, in particular, for The Terminal, you had Catherine Zeta-Jones, uh, in addition to Stanley Tucci playing the villain, Chi McBride, Diego Luna, Zoe Saldana, really uh, around the time she was getting her footing uh, back in. It's a great ensemble and a great story. I think Tom Hanks is best when he plays a sentimental character, somebody that you can root for and you really hope makes it out alive. I mean, it's the Forrest Gump thing, right? You can't get away from it. But this movie, you really feel for the guy. Like He's just trying to go get an autograph for his dad, but the world just really uh, took a dump on him, man. Uh, PG rating. So, um, and again, Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks working together again, like, I, I don't know, I, I'm going to bring it up because it, it really irritates me. It has a 61% on Rotten Tomatoes for some reason for the critic score and an audience score of 74%. Not great, but better, I guess. Uh, I, I don't understand that. And uh, one of the big arguments that I heard when I beta tested this question was that it's a, uh, it's more of a comedy than we're used to getting from uh, Spielberg and, and Hanks particularly. I, I don't understand that. When comedy is good, it's really good. And Tom Hanks is a genuinely funny actor. Like everything he did back in the 80s from uh, Big all the way through, uh, or I should say from the Burbs through Big, was just comedic genius. That guy has great comedic timing. That's why they had him on SNL so many times. I, I don't understand this argument. The, it has such a fantastic uh, comedic timing and and it, it doesn't focus solely on the comedy. It gives you this really heartwarming story and this love story and this civil rights story because we got we got to touch on that. As far as I'm concerned, this is Oscar worthy type stuff. I don't get it, but I really like the terminal. Awesome. All right, that will be time on the round. Zach, back over to you, sir. Two more minutes. Now you brought up Stanley Tucci as the somewhat villain in the terminal if you want to go for a more existential uh villain this movie has it and that's kind of loneliness it's like you he is with he is all by himself for a majority of the film so you get to see the range of emotions from the highs like the fire scene to lows like like i said loneliness or even the Wilson, like the losing Wilson scene. So it's like you get to see that and you also get to see like how dedicated Tom Hanks is in this movie because if I remember correctly, he lost about 50 pounds to play this movie. So you could see just how dedicated he was. And like um, that's what I... Um, the other thing that I liked about this is that the ending is kind of like to your own interpretation. Like it's open-ended and so you don't know what direction he's going to go in at the end, which I think that actually makes for a good movie. With I think with the terminal, it's like you kind of have that at the end, but you know basically what the ending is. And for all those points, I'm going to cede the rest of my time. All right. We'll go ahead and bump it forward by the 30 seconds or ish. Uh, all right. So we are going to get into the four minute open discussion. The timer will begin ticking when the first competitor speaks. Uh, to counter, I think Tom Hanks is dedicated in any role that guy takes. Like, he doesn't take that stuff lightly. That's, that's his craft. He, he hones it and he sculpts it. Uh, and yeah, I agree. You do feel that sort of desperation. That's the villain of the movie for Castaway. For a huge ensemble piece like The Terminal, I would argue that it's more difficult uh, to get those personalities to mix, to get that chemistry going between each actor because everybody is something of a household name. Uh, probably not at the time that the movie came out, except for, you know, Stanley Tucci, Tom Hanks, Catherine Zeta-Jones. Okay, never mind. Forget what I said. They were all pretty seasoned, so they know what they're doing. Well, and talking about, like, an ensemble cast, I feel like that a little bit hurts Terminal because, like, Tom Hanks has to rely on 
the ensemble in order to bring out both his performance and their performances. Like I said, with the majority of this film, it's just Tom Hanks. So you get to see that range that he has. And I feel like you get to witness all that he goes through the highs and the lows with this movie. I think that's a hard sell uh, for most people. I think Castaway is a great movie. I, I don't think it's better than The Terminal. It depends on the day I'm having. But if it's only one actor the whole time, I think that's really hard to sell to a general audience. Um, whereas a huge ensemble piece like The Terminal, you're going to put butts in seats with that. And... Um... Again, I I do like the terminal. It's just like do you um I don't agree that it is a comedy, so I do agree with you on that. I but I just feel like you get like you get some emotion with Tom Hanks in the terminal, but I feel like it's elevated in this movie. I don't know. I disagree. I feel like every little victory he has in the terminal, you feel that. Like, he got enough quarters to get a, a Whopper from the Burger King. Hell yeah, man. You know, you you wanted that for him so bad. Um, but, again, I think that's just the kind of actor that Tom Hanks is. Like, he can make you feel that sort of that sort of uh, uh, triumph of just eating a hamburger. The other thing I will say is, like, I feel like there wasn't much like elevation in terms of like company wide after the terminal from what I read, like um, hiring for FedEx actually went up after Castaway, So that actually could have been another benefit of my movie. Potentially. I would agree with you if there weren't so many shipping problems at the moment in the country. Uh, but I'm going to, I'm going to table that for right now. Uh, I will say that Tom Hanks is great with Catherine Z Jones, but in addition to that, you also get Diego Luna and Zoe Saldana as uh, Cruz and Dolores getting their, their own chemistry going. And it's adorable. And once again, you really want that for them. You really want them to triumph as for the ending it's loosely based on this actual story of this dude who spent 18 years in an airport. We could have easily done that ending, but instead we just we decided to give him his goal, his his journey through this entire movie is just to meet um, Benny Golson, that's the name, uh, to get him to sign that newspaper article for his dad. Uh, and I, I don't know, that's a feel good moment for me. With Castaway, you see. Uh, his girlfriend go off with her new family and you're just kind of left there. Like he survived on this Island just to be left alone again. But, but at least with that, yes, he, she has a new family, but at least they were able to like connect at the end and have that moment. So he still kind of got that positive. All right. We're going to go into closings. Alejandro, you are up first one minute on the clock. This is a tough one, man. I think it's a coin flip. I do not uh, envy the judges at all trying to pick between these two movies. Uh, I I think Castaway has a lot of greatness about it. I think The Terminal is a great time start to finish. Uh, Castaway, really, I think if you market it as a horror movie, it has a little more uh, heft to it. Like, you don't know if that dude's going to get off the island. But mm, with the tone that the movie sets, you kind of get that he's going to get off the island, and pretty quick. Um, the Terminal, again, we could have easily just had him spend so many years in this airport and drawn out that story. But instead, we decided to have that feel-good moment, because that's what Spielberg and Tom Hanks do, at least for me, most of the time. So, for that reason, I... I would. I think I would rather watch the terminal than cast away on any given Sunday, and I'll see you the rest. All right, Zach. When it runs down to zero, you can go ahead and begin your final minute. So while I do agree that the terminal is a very good Tom Hanks movie, I feel like you get more of an impact with. Castaway in terms of you having someone 
for a majority of the movie by themselves with showing the range of emotions and the lengths that someone will go to in order to escape either an island or just loneliness in general. And like I said, it had an impact on a company. And it just, again, it just shows the small victories of like escaping from an island or even making fire. So for that, I think that's why I believe Castaway is the better movie, Tom Hanks movie of the 2000s. All right, that is going to be time. I'll go ahead and sit you guys in the back once again as I bring in the judges. Uh, just a couple of uh, small fact checks based on what was said in the round. Uh, so, yes, the Rotten Tomatoes scores were given for the terminal because of a 61% like rating on Rotten Tomatoes and a 74% like rating from audiences to 61 is from critics. Uh, in terms of Castaway, it was talked about Tom Hanks' uh, weight loss. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is, uh, unlike, say, for example, Christian Bale, where he will naturally gain and lose weight flu to shift fluctually, Tom Hanks actually did it the opposite way. Uh, when they initially did filming for the, uh, the beginning of the film, the end of the film, and the first few scenes on the island prior to the weight shift, Tom Hanks actually gained about 50, 55 pounds. So he would look bigger than normal for those scenes so that during the process where he they took time off, uh, Zemeckis made another movie, he grew his beard out. During that time, he actually lost the 50 pounds that he had gained for the start of the movie so that he could look of a more normal physique for him and still be healthy without while still looking smaller than he had been once the film began. Uh, in terms of talking about uh, the stories that inspired both of these, both of these movies are actually would fall into the category of inspired by something real while not being based on something real. As Alejandro said, uh, the Terminal is inspired by the real-life story of uh, Miran Nasiri, who, after being denied entry due to losing a travel visa, uh, spent 18 years at an airport in France in their terminal from 1988 uh, to 2006 so he was actually still there while the movie was made and only left about two years after the movie was finished uh, but it was not directly based on that similar with castaway of uh, the story of tom hanks's character was inspired by real life stories that they had collected however no one particular story was the direct basis and as such none of them are technically credited in the film but they have said publicly that multiple different stories of people being stranded were inspired uh used to inspire the character in the things he does uh with that said though austin you are up first sir so i'll go to you who gets your vote and what was the main selling point yeah it was another uh good back and forth um for me uh i think alejandro really dominated the the back and forth round and gave me a lot more of a wide spectrum about uh terminal and really hitting on those little minor victories throughout the thing the characterizations the ensemble um and was really able to like jab it uh cast away just a few more times than than the, the other way around so i went with alejandro all right, Chris, down to you. Who gets your vote, and what was the selling point? And same thing, Alejandra, to debate boundary life. I mean, did that give more example, or does that look at more stuff that Tom Hanks has done with his family side of learning it? I've actually said that, Alejandra, does that give an example? You can't see your moment like the Burger King. It's not an example. Okay. All right, judges, thank you guys so much. I'm going to go ahead and sit you in the back as we move on to round number four and earlier uh, we referenced a movie that is set to come out uh, in elvis but this fourth question uh is inspired by a movie that has come out as top gun maverick uh is nearing its uh I believe fourth week at the box office uh the movie was an incredible success obviously it opens one of the highest openings of the year so far uh, at uh, well over a uh, hundred million. I believe it took the record for highest opening weekend on Memorial Day of all time, both three day and four day, which is pretty impressive. Uh, it also is in, I believe, the top 10 for second week highest grosses of all time. It earned about uh, just under 90 million in its second week, which is again, incredibly fucking impressive. Uh, for a movie that is a sequel to a movie that's 30 years old, 40 years old nearly. Uh, and, of course, that movie was directed by one Tony Scott. Now, if you don't know Tony Scott, 
brother to the more famous Ridley Scott. Uh, however, uh, I've spoken with people and I've heard multiple people kind of give the sentiment that while Ridley's films may have higher peaks, if you look at Tony Scott's filmography, he actually might be more consistent than his brother. The peaks might not be as high, but consistently he knew the types of movies that he was making and he was putting out solid films nonetheless, including directing the original Top Gun. So in honor of that film's success and, of course, the deceased Mr. Tony Scott, the question here is, what is his most underrated movie? Because he has a lot of good movies, but people may not know what he has made. So which one is the most underrated? With that said, Zach, you are up first this time around. I'll bring the timer back in for you, and it will begin ticking when you start speaking, sir. So in almost all of Tony Scott's movies, you have to deal with the human element. The movie that I chose for his most underrated has very little human element in it, and that is Unstoppable. And I will see the rest of my time until my two minutes. All right. Let me go ahead and bring the timer back in. All right, Alejandro, when it flips over to zero, you can go ahead and get started, sir. You know how I know that Beverly Hills Cop 2 is Tony Scott's most underrated movie? Because I forgot he directed it. <laughs> Beverly Hills Cop 2 is, or I should say it was, a, I think, a risk on Tony Scott's part at the time. It was a sequel to a wildly successful movie. Uh, of course, Eddie Murphy was on fire at the time, but... but Tony Scott was an action director, really still is. So for him to do something as a uh, screwball comedy with like Saturday Night Live type stuff as Beverly Hills Cop 2, I, I think makes it an un unbelievably underrated movie. Uh, I don't think anybody would actually remember that Beverly Hills Cop 2 was directed by Tony Scott had I not said anything. So uh, for that reason, I'm going to go with Beverly Hills Cop 2, the middle child uh, of the Beverly Hills Cop franchise, and I'll see the rest of my time. All right, so Zach, same thing back to you, sir. When the clock rolls around to zero, you can go ahead and begin speaking for your two minutes. So the reason I chose Unstoppable as like his most underrated is kind of the human element because the villain, if you want to call it that, is a runaway train that this train company is just trying to stop from destroying a city so it the train has no emotions so you it's something you can't really reason with and even though it's a another great denzel washington and tony scott movie it's like you still get that but you also get a more personal movie because you get to learn the backstories of him and Chris Pine, and about both of their families. In comparison, like you with Beverly Hills Cop 2, it deals a lot with emotion and with comedy. And it just seems like this movie has a lot more like thrills and intensity to it. And that to me draws you in more about wanting to see what will happen throughout the movie. And I will see the rest of my time. All right. Go ahead and jump forward there. All right, Alejandro, time starts when you begin speaking. I don't know what you're talking about, man. Emotion and comedy can carry a, a story, especially an action story. Please see Lethal Weapon for reference uh, through a very, very satisfying conclusion. Again, I think Beverly Hills 2 is kind of forgotten about. It's the middle child. Like, everybody loves Beverly Hills Cops 1 and 3, but Beverly Hills Cop 2 gets no love. That's why I ultimately went with it for Tony Scott's uh, least, or I should say, most underrated film. It... It gets no love. It just doesn't. I, I don't know what it is about the movie. We get uh, John Ashton and Judge Reinhold back uh, for their reprising roles, as well as uh, Gilbert R. Hill, who uh, plays Inspector Todd, who is always a hoot. He's just chewing out Axel every chance he gets. Uh, 
you also had Jurgen, uh, what's his name? Prochow, Pro that's what it is. Uh, Pro Pro now? Can't remember. And uh, Dick Jones himself, Ronnie Cox playing the villains. I'm pretty sure it's in their contract every time they're in a movie, they got to play the bad guys. Uh, I, I didn't, uh, I, and I'll go ahead and throw this out there. It has a 47% on Rotten Tomatoes. I think Beverly Hills Cop 1 has a 83% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes and an 82 in audiences, whereas Beverly Hills Cop 2 has a 57. I, I, I don't see it as that drastic of a change, personally, from those movies. Uh, but Buddy Cop films had uh, become something of a staple for the 80s. Uh, this movie, I think, helped pioneer that, uh, even if it did only follow, uh, uh, yes, the better movie. I, I will throw that out there. <laughs> Beverly Hills Cop uh, is better than Beverly Hills Cop 2, but not by much. I think Eddie Murphy is still funny. And again, he was on fire at the time. He was taken off and running with everything that he had, especially doing his stand-up and so forth. So I think uh, Beverly Hills Cop 2 should be considered Tony Scott's most underrated movie for those reasons alone. <laughs> and I'll see the rest. All right. So as the clock winds down, when it hits zero, we'll get to the open debate round. The first person who speaks. Well, go ahead. I I think for me, the what kind of sets Unstoppable apart is kind of the motivation of the villains in Beverly Hills Cop Two because it just deals with illegal arms trafficking and. We've seen that in so many movies, and like it's another like cop movie, be it a but kind of a buddy cop movie, but it just seems like it's a kind of a movie that we've seen before, even with Eddie Murphy on the rise. At least with mine, it's like you you're dealing with a runaway train, and you just have to have these two guys find a way to stop that train before it causes too much damage. I don't know. I don't think thrills and intensity automatically make it a better movie. They're, they're different uh, types of movies for sure. Uh, Unstoppable is more of a disaster movie. Like you said, it's, it's just something that happened to these people that they have to deal with. Beverly Hills cop is, and I, I can't comfortably say that it, it's been done a long time, especially when the movie came out in 1986. Like, that's super early on, especially for buddy cop movies. Well, yeah. So maybe buddy cop movies just haven't been, like, a staple yet. But it's it definitely spawned more of that type of movie. But you've definitely seen the, like, the tra the arms trafficking or drug, drug trafficking in a good number of movies. So it's oh, just... Sure. So in that, case, in that case, you just didn't you had something, you had a motivation that just was kind of the same. I mean, if you're talking about the same motivation, I mean, you had speed. <laughs> that that was just kind of, I mean, there was a villain in that one, but the same kind of thing. And, and the intensity is about the speed and, and the cinematography that, that you use to show off that. Because if you don't feel that intensity, your movie's going to fall flat. Eddie Murphy is going to be funny no matter what. And uh, Tony Scott actually does a really good job with uh, the action in that movie because you can't get away with it, or you can't get away from it, I should say. You need that in these movies to get... Uh, it's in the title. <laughs> yeah, and, and and again, and this is just typical for all action movies, it's, a, it's just a lot of gun violence, and it seems like that's all action movies. I feel like this is could be considered a disaster movie or a action movie where you just have to use your what you have riding in to in order to derail the other oncoming train so it's like that you have what is just given to you if if that makes sense uh, no i i agree with you and i and i see what you're saying uh, beverly hills cop 2 is definitely a linear story but that's not a bad thing, in my opinion. Like, you don't need... Uh, no, I, I don't think it's a bad thing, so... No, well, I meant specifically for this type of movie, because it is a comedy, ultimately. Like, yeah, you do have your action moments, and Eddie Murphy's actually a pretty good stuntman, but uh, it, at the end of the day, you watch the movie to laugh. 
And, and like I said, with I feel like with Beverly Hills Cop 2, it's like you don't get to really like know the backstories of characters. You you just you know what is being shown to you. In an in, right. in unstoppable, you get to learn about Denzel Washington's family and the situation with Chris Pine and his family. So I feel like you get to have that more personal factor to it. I think Unstoppable is Tony Scott's bread and butter. That's the kind of movie he would normally make. Beverly Hills Cop 2 is a shot in the dark. That's why I think it was a risk for him to do that movie is because it, Beverly Hills Cop was a comedy and he doesn't generally do that stuff. And time. All right, we're going to go into the one minute closing. Zach, you are up first. Time starts when you begin speaking, sir. So with most of Tony Scott's movies, you deal, like I said, with the human aspect of it and with emotions. With this, the only emotions you really deal with are with the two main conductors of this train just trying to stop a runaway train and the impact it could have on a whole community and the devastation it could have. So in comparison to Beverly Hills Cop 2, you also get to learn like the more personal aspects of the main characters. And I just feel like for that aspect, that's why I feel like Unstoppable is the most underrated Tony Scott movie. All right. And I'll give you those couple seconds back, Alejandro, but time starts when you begin speaking. Ultimately, I think uh, Beverly Hills Cop 2 is a good time. I, I don't think you need anything more than what you get from that movie in order to enjoy it. Uh, Unstoppable, it has its moments for sure. Um, but again, I think we're used to seeing that kind of stuff from Tony Scott. What we're not seeing, what we're not used to seeing from that guy is <laughs> like, it, it, we just never see him poke fun at, at anything. So this. Beverly Hills Cop 2 is obviously the most underrated of the of the Tony Scott films. And it come it came completely out of nowhere. Nobody even knows that he directed the movie. And, and I think uh, Unstoppable is kind of a garden variety for him. I'm I'm circling back around, so I'll see the rest of my time. Okay. All right, guys. Another solid round there. I'm gonna go ahead and sit you both in the back as I bring in our judges uh, and I have just a couple of small things to run through. So uh, again, just in case anyone out there isn't a hundred percent sure of who Tony Scott is, because I feel like of all the directors you hear of and speak of, uh, he is definitely one of the lesser known ones who has made big films. I feel like that's not insane to say. Uh, in addition to the two films listed today, and of course, Top Gun as reference, uh, he also directed Days of Thunder, The Last Boy Scout, True Romance, Crimson Tide, uh, Enemy of the State, Man on Fire, Deja Vu, and The Taking of Pelham 123, the remake, of course, not the original. Uh, so, you know, definitely a lot of films there that people have seen. Uh, the Beverly Hills Cop series, uh, it has an interesting history with directors, obviously, if you're talking about Tony Scott directing it and this potentially being a little bit out of his wheelhouse. When you look at the other two, the first one was directed by Martin Brest, who prior to this had directed uh, the original Going in Style, and following this, he would go on to direct uh, things like the Al Pacino Academy Award-winning film Scent of a Woman, and his career would actually end in 2003 after he directed Geely. Uh, similarly, Beverly Hills Cop 3 was directed by John Landis, who, again, didn't really do films like Beverly Hills Cop, but had worked with Eddie Murphy a handful of times and thus took on the project. Uh, when we're talking about uh, the Beverly Hills Cop films, the Rotten Tomato scores given were correct. The first one does have an 83% critic-like rating, 82% audience. Beverly Hills, Cop, or Beverly Hills Cop 2 is a drop, 47% critic, 57% audience. And the third one is an even further drop with a 9% critic-like rating and a 35% audience like rating uh when talking about buddy cop films uh the origin of the buddy cop film uh, according to my research uh, can originally be traced back to akira kurosawa uh, with the film stray dog starring toshiro mifuni and takashi shimura uh, which is considered the original buddy cop film if we're talking about american films uh, in the heat of the night in 1967 is considered the first major buddy cop film uh, however, Eddie Murphy is credited with the popularization of it, both through 48 Hours and its sequel alongside Nick Nolte and the Beverly Hills Cop films, all of which came out over the course of the decade of the 80s. 
Uh, so certainly while he's not the original, he isn't a creditor for popularizing that approach towards the genre. Uh, with that said, though, it is about the facts stated in the match, not the fun stuff I find. Uh, so, Chris, I go to you. Who gets your vote and what's sold you? This is an interesting match. Just outlay how Alejandro pulled out in the end. Like, you didn't get compared to Brett Flair. Like, you know, Alejandro is still the best wrestler in the world. He made it down for why Brett Flair Cop 2 is the more underrated Chinese uh, guy. Okay, Austin, I go down to you then, sir. Who gets your vote, and what was the main selling point? Yeah, I uh, kind of had a similar thought. Um, it was pretty even for me up for up till about the the bat latter half of the match, where um, Alejandro for me started digging into more of like it being an under or, or as far as both underrated and an unconventional Tony Scott movie, and like talking about how he didn't really usually do comedy and un unstoppable is kind of like you know kind of one of the same, and uh, just gave me a little more as far as it being underrated. So I went with Alejandro. All right. Well, judges, thank you guys so much. I'm going to go ahead and sit you guys in the back because your winner by a final score of three to one, it is Alejandro Hernandez coming in with the big win, sir. Congratulations on your debut win. Thank uh, you. How are you feeling after that? Man, I can't believe it. <laughs> that was wild. I had never actually won one of these before. So, man. For, to get that first official win, man, that feels good. Now it's out of the way. I don't have to worry about it. It's not looming over me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You, you, you got it out of the way. You got the one, and now from here on out, whatever happens, happens. Right, exactly. And I, I, as always, I'm just happy to play the game. This is a blast. I love doing this. And, man, Zach was a hell of a competitor, dude. That was way harder than the, the 420 exhibition, like way harder. And I was half-stoned on that recording. <laughs> So was everybody else. <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> Medi I I'm not kidding. It's not a joke when he says it. I legitimately don't think Medi remembers large portions of that night. And it's on camera, so that's the scary part. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Hey, we have it on record. <laughs> Uh, no, man. So, and uh, the same with both of you guys, because you're both rookies, because you're both here, you know, uh, obviously we have the Invitational Tournament this summer, so that's going to take up a chunk of the matches, but we want to make sure that over the course of the summer, you know, the people who aren't playing in that, we want to make sure they get at least something at some point in the summer. So later this summer, uh, you are going to have a second match, and because you have uh, you do have the experience from the uh, 420 match, whatever experience you want to call that. You've got the win tonight. You also have the uh, Pixar exhibition match coming up, which you are a competitor in. Uh, I'm giving. I'm, I'm going to step you up a little bit. Your next competitor is going to be Andy Sweet, uh, who is currently two and two with one knockout. He is coming Ooh. in fresh off of a knockout victory. So he's had some tough losses. He's played some top competitors and taken the hard losses, but. He's proved himself here, and both of you guys are kind of in that similar position where, you know, the plan right now is uh, uh, following kind of battleground tradition. Uh, we're doing a tournament at the end of the year with the best 16 players, and a win for either of you in this match would solidify you in that tournament. So how are you feeling about that matchup? Do you know anything about Andy, or are you just excited to play? Well, I mean, hey, no pressure, right? <laughs> I, I'm super excited to face Andy. Are you kidding me? That'd be awesome. Uh whether or not I get the victory, that, that'll that be up to the fates, I guess. But, man, I'm still going to come in hard. I'm going to prep as, as much as I can for that one. Whew, that one's going to be tough. But I look forward to it greatly. And the Pixar exhibition as well. I mean, those are always just for fun. But I, I need to get more serious about my competition. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Well, congratulations once again. I'm going to go ahead and sit you in the back. But thank you for being with us, sir. As thank you, sir. And send you back and bring in your opponent. Well, Zach, unfortunately, it doesn't end in a victory for you tonight, but I hope there is the moral victory of the fact that you are here a part of the battleground. How are you feeling after the match? Uh, good. I I wish it could have gone better, but I, at least I got the first battleground out of the way. I had fun. Uh, wanted to congratulate Alejandro again on a great match. I think we both brought it, and he just brought it a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. It, it definitely, especially that Middle Earth round, I think you guys had a really good back and forth going. I think that despite the fact that it didn't go your way tonight, you did show flashes at moments of being able to get into it. And I do think, as you said, confidence is a thing that will have to build in you. Uh, and so uh, same thing, man, you know, we don't want to leave people sitting on the sidelines for too long. Now, we're not going to step you up too tough. You are going to be getting another 0-1 competitor. Uh, you will be playing Richie Goodacre, who in his first match, kind of a similar approach. 
you know, very cool, very calm, very collected, happy to be here, uh, you know, building the confidence throughout the match. His first match was a knockout loss, but I'm sure he'll be looking to attempt to rebound. I guess in your mind, it'll be your job to stop that. Uh, what do you know about Richie, if anything, and what are your thoughts about coming back? Uh, I really don't know anything about Richie, so I'm just excited to face off against somebody else, and let's see how that goes. All right. Well, congratulations on being here, sir. A very, very solid debut, and we'll see you next time that you are here as I go ahead and sit you guys in the back. And that is it once again on another match in the movie Battleground. I want to say first off, thank you to my judges, Austin Howell and Chris Diaz. Thank you guys for being here, making the show run, because without you guys, it would just be me judging. And, and we did that before for many years. Nobody wants that shit again. Uh, it was awful. Uh, we Be sure to stick around, guys, because shortly after this record match ends, uh, we do have the second half of our Battleground Blitz coming up. And as I mentioned, with all that said, though, thank you to everyone for watching. Please be sure to rate the video, comment, subscribe, uh, and we will see you guys next time on the Movie Battleground. Take care, everybody.